So I want to talk about energy uh, for obvious reasons because it's become a uh, extraordinarily important subject. And I begin with an observation given what's going on in, the, in world events today. Which will context why I will, <coughs> excuse me, I'll tell you in advance as a spoiler alert what I'm going to say. You won't be surprised to know that I'm going to tell you that there isn't an energy transition underway. And this is not a political observation. The politics I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I'd like to deal in, f in data and facts. And uh, I also happen to think words matter. I write a lot. I've written a number of books. I write a, I write a column. I, I'm, I, I'm habituated to writing as a, a more of an obsession than a calling. But I've always liked to write. And you learn as a writer that words, words matter. Words are powerful. But the definitions matter. A transition as is, is a word has meaning. It means we've you're leaving something, going to something else. So I'm going to show you, in, in, by way of facts and numbers, and I guess I should apologize for at, at lunchtime using data and facts and numbers, but <coughs> they, they, they kind of matter. I'm not going to use slides, so I'm going to spare you that, the PowerPointification of a speech. But I use them a lot with audiences because the, the data are important on all this stuff. You know, we're having a conflagration again in the Middle East, which is not, not pleasant. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. It's not altogether surprising. There's been no five-year period in a half a century where there hasn't been a war of some kind in the Middle East. So it's unsurprising, even though it's profoundly unpleasant and unsettling. But to speak about not the human toll that's being taken there, but if you look at how markets are reacting to what's going on, it's kind of interesting initially. <clears throat> uh, Middle East is, as you doubtless know, still the source of a lot of the world's oil. And, and the world oil markets haven't really reacted. Price hasn't changed much. Ticked up a bit, relaxed back. And uh, the equity markets haven't reacted much either. And uh, just as a calibration point, 50 years ago this month, as you, some of you in this room are of a certain age, like I am, and I was driving at, in the 50-year-ago episode when we had the Arab oil embargo of 1973. So. What you'd want, think about this, so we're in an energy transition, so the world's different today, lots different about the world, you know, the, you know that adage that history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. <clears throat> so you want to look for what's, what's rhyming, what's, what's different today. So why hasn't the world reacted? Well, 50 years ago when the Arab oil embargo started, the world, there was no, no significant reaction in the equity markets. Nothing happened when that invasion happened other than the world was shocked at it. Uh, but about two and a half weeks after the invasion began, 50 years ago, the then president, who was the now vilified President Nixon, but at that time, as some of you may recall in American history, I studied it to pass my you know, citizenship license, so I had to figure out how I could become a citizen and know American history. I did study it in school, too. Uh, Nixon was uh, elected in an overwhelming landslide, if, if for those of you who have forgotten, as the law and order president at the time because the country was in, in the chaos, not, un, not unlike where we are today in terms of the sexual revolution, which was going on at that time, and race riots going on at the time, and crime was up, and he, he won in a huge landslide. It's fascinating. But anyway, two weeks after the Arab oil embargo and the invasion of, of, the, of Israel by the Arab nations at that time, uh, Nixon asked Congress for $2 billion of that day, so in today's inflation to us dollars, it would be something in the order of $15 billion. So he asked for a big check from Congress to help Israel. And that's what triggered the political reaction on the part of the Saudis <coughs> to embargo. And they issued a, uh, not an embargo, what's, 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 what mattered was that they cut production by 5%. And then sequentially cut production over the next 10 weeks to a total of 25% of production cut. The point of the production cut was to punish the West. That was the point. It wasn't that they thought it would result in the West changing its mind. It was, it was a political reaction through a, a production cut. The production cut resulted in a 400% increase in the price of oil over the, that 10 weeks. So imagine the political reaction today if oil went up 400%. So it, it was tectonic then, for any of those we all remember, and the tectonic reaction led to the, the world, including the United States, deciding that uh, we were running out of oil. We weren't running out of oil. We, we, the world was not running out of oil then, it's not running out of oil now. What happened is we were running out of, I guess you could say common sense, we were running out of something, but not oil. 
But then we, we had landmark legislation passed in the United States and all over the Western world to become obsessed with finding alternatives to, for oil. <coughs> and we spent hundreds of billions of dollars over that 50 years. And uh, so where are we today, 50 years later? So I'll give you a calibration point in terms of the energy transition and whether oil matters. Because remember, we started a ostensible transition a half century ago. In fact, the United States alone, through the Department of Energy and the various energy policy and conservation acts, the federal government alone has spent over $500 billion to avoid using oil. The state, state governments, every state has an energy agency of some kind, also spent comparable collective amount of money. So that would be a trillion total. And Europe did the same thing. So trillions of dollars spent to avoid, not to produce more oil, but oil production increases that followed didn't come from government policies directed at increasing oil production. They came from private markets uh, reacting and drilling for more oil. So com today compared to then, just to give you a, a sense of calibration on whether or not we've had an energy transition, I'll stick with oil, I'll turn to electricity in a second. As 95% of the world's transportation of goods and people and services is achieved by burning oil today, 95%. Of the five percentage points that are left that's not from burning oil, three and a half is from burning uh, otherwise useful food, it's ethanol. The United States and Brazil, the two biggest producers of ethanol for transportation. And then about a little under 1% so-called biofuels, this is biodiesel. And then less than 1% is from electric vehicles, the electric vehicle revolution. So the world today, everything about an economy that makes an economy possible is the trade and movement of goods and people. And the trade and movement of goods and people is all about oil, full stop. There's no exception. In fact, if we think about the magnitude of the change in the demand to transport things and people, today compared to then, there are four times more vehicles on the road globally. A 400% increase in the total number of light duty and private vehicles globally. The increase in freight tons moved around the world, all of it by oil, is sevenfold higher than 50 years ago. So there's a 700% increase in the quantity of freight tonnage of goods and materials, not oil and gas, the freight tonnage of stuff that we, from food to vehicles to commodities. Or if you measure the other metric where oil is used, of course, is air travel. And the total amount of air travel consumed, if you like, in revenue miles, passengers paying to fly somewhere on oil-powered airplanes, it's up 20-fold in the last 50 years. <clears throat> so, in obviously in absolute and in relative terms, whichever metric you want to use, we haven't had any transition. Now, clearly we're being told that was then, this is now, where you're living in the time, you've heard the word over and over again, of an accelerating energy transition. It's accelerating, certainly the rhetoric is accelerating, and the amount of spending of the Congress has accelerated recently, I'll get to that. But in terms of the last just 20 years, never mind 50 years, let's just measure the 20 years of so-called, I'll call it climate awareness, where the Western world, principally Europe and the United States, have become obsessed with avoiding burning hydrocarbons because of carbon dioxide emissions and spent in that 20 year period, $5 trillion directly in the United States and Europe, and another $5 trillion indirectly. Those mandates result in spending. Washington is particularly eager to do mandates. Mandates are a way of, vo of avoiding exposing the cost of what you're <laughs> putting on an economy. If you have to appropriate the money, you're out there naked, exposed to appropriating the five trillion. But if you just mandate something that costs the economy another five trillion, well, you know, the market's supposed to figure that out. Free markets, so they invoke. So these are mandates. So 10 trillion has been spent in the last 20 years. So, uh, mostly on wind and solar, by the way. This is the primary vector and, and batteries to some extent in the, last, in the last decade, batteries for electric vehicles. So where are we today? Globally, again, the energy transition is supposed to be global because the reason for the energy transition is global carbon dioxide emissions. That's the context of all the spending in the United States. It's always about global. So what you'd want to know is where are we? Well, I mean, th you probably know this. What share of the world's energy comes from wind and solar? Wind and solar are the primary vectors and recipients of these mandates and subsidies. In fact, in the International Energy Agency's net zero plan and forecast for the next 20 years, 70% of all the spending proposed, planned, or imagined is for wind and solar and for batteries. Not for hydrogen and nuclear power and wood. There's smattering a lot of stuff, but it's 
wind, solar, and batteries. It's an obsession with wind, solar, and batteries. So as of right now, after 10 trillion and change, just under 4% of the world's energy comes from wind and solar combined. Four percentage points. It's about 3.6. As a calibration, burning wood globally provides 10% of world energy. So right now, the magic, inevitable, accelerating transition away from hydrocarbons has yet to beat the oldest form of energy in mankind. We're not at 10 percentage points yet. We'll get the, I think we'll get to 10 percentage points, by the way, over the next decade. It's about, that's a tripling, roughly double tripling of wind and solar. That's, oh, we're on track to spend that kind of money. We'll, we'll get there. Is that a transition? <clears throat> well, obviously it's not. The word, the word has meaning. In fact, the a IEA's net zero plan, the aspirational plan, and by the way, the plan is not something that countries are implementing. The Paris Accord we've heard lots about. The Paris Accord has pledges that the signatories made to get off hydrocarbons. None of the signatories are meeting their pledges, never mind the aspirational plans. So they're not actually doing what they can. They're spending a lot of money, but they're not doing the plan. But if they were to do the plan and the pledge, then the IEA imagines that the world would get a lot less of its energy from hydrocarbons. And they do a PowerPoint and a graph and they show all this stuff and they, 2050, what, the only notable thing about their forecast is that in 2050, after spending what will have to have been an accumulated capital uh, deployment of over $150 trillion on non-hydrocarbons, that's the, the magnitude of spending we're talking about. These are very big numbers, right? Uh, the world will still get half of its energy from hydrocarbons. So if you, if you were a strategist or a planner or an investor, you, uh, the first question you would ask, well, two questions. Do you really think we're going to spend $150 trillion to get to a point where the world still gets half of its energy from hydrocarbons? Maybe more importantly, who supplies those hydrocarbons? At the end of that period of that amount of spending to avoid hydrocarbons, those who are remaining producing half of the world's energy will have some remarkable pricing power. So you'd really want to know who, the, who we think those countries are going to be. And maybe you'd want to know what would happen if we missed the goals, if the $150 trillion didn't buy you what they claimed, but only bought you 90% of what you claimed. Because there's a reasonable chance that could happen. 90% is a pretty good, pretty good batting average over uh, you know, two, two decades plus. It's just, again, a fact to have in mind. If the world fails to meet its energy transition aspirations, and plans. These aren't things that are under construction. By 10 percentage points, the increased call on hydrocarbons would be equal to the entire production of natural gas from Qatar, which is currently the, one of the world's biggest natural gas exporters. It would also require an entire addition of oil equal to the Permian Basin of the United States, and it would require additional production of coal equal all of what Australia currently exports. Australia is the world's biggest coal exporter. All three things would have to happen on the margin if the green goals fail by 10 percent. So when I say there's not going to be an energy transition, I'm saying it just as a matter of semantic fact. It's, it's not a transition, it's an addition to supplies, and it's a, the attempt to affect the transition entails enormous uh, geopolitical and economic risk. Could you do it if you just really wanted to, or just keep throwing money at it? Let me, let me give you sort of another calibration fact point. The goal is to get to 0% of the world's energy being produced by hydrocarbons from today to 2050. I will say that that's essentially impossible based on our ability to deploy the hardware at the scale imagined. So this is a construction project. Doesn't matter if the sun is free and the wind blows. This is totally irrelevant. You have to build hardware. You have to have backhoes and machines, dig stuff up. You have to build things. How much stuff do you have to build to affect that goal? It's really hard to put it in any kind of context because it's, it's the world. It's big numbers. So uh, uh, there's a lot of ways you could do this, but maybe the easiest way to visualize it is from today over the, to, to the year 2050. So out 30 years, the 2050 net zero goal. If the world were to replace all of its hydrocarbon consuming machines, say with windmills, because it's wind and solar are the preferred, how many windmills do you have to build? This is just arithmetic. The answer is, is easily knowable. You need to build about 1,000 
three megawatt windmills. So for those of you who don't know what that is, that's the size of a Washington Monument. So it's a wind turbine, 500 feet high. You have to build and install, build and finish a thousand of them a day, every day for 30 years. It's just not, it's just not gonna happen. This is crazy numbers. So could we, you build 100 a day? Yeah, probably. We're not building 100 a day now because they got expensive, everybody's backing off. But a thou, a, that's the kind of scale where, or if you want to put it in nuclear power terms because your, your, one of your neighboring states has got you know, a big new nuke going, so it's 1,000 megawatt nuke. There'd be one of those, one of those would have to be built, installed, and running every single day for 30 years. This, these, are, these are scales of construction that are simply not going to happen. In fact, they put it in dollar terms, because usually what matters, and I learned this early on in politics, then I learned it, in, <laughs> you learn it in life once you get of a certain age, you know, follow the money. It's, the, it's always the money that matters. So how much is it going to cost? So what do I get for my money? I mean, that's in the end what will matter. So the, the Orwellian named Inflation Reduction Act for the United States uh, has a budget a face budget of about $680 billion, call it $700 billion. So Goldman Sachs and another a consultancy called Wood McKenzie, they do terrific work in the energy business. They costed, like the CBO should have done, what the Inflation Reduction Act will really cost over the next decade by looking at the cost of the mandates. Because the mandates in the Inflation Reduction Act are, are gifts and subsidies that are not appropriated. They're, they're simply given out each year, magically by printing money. So they're unappropriated mandates. It's between two and three trillion dollars uh, was the total cost of the Inflation Reduction Act. And what do you get for the two to three trillion dollars? Well, other than follow the money, and, and this will certainly inspire a lot of kleptocratic behavior, honest, honest kleptocratic behavior, it's a lot of money. So every, every single business that's involved in anything to do with energy is trying to figure out how to get a piece of that. That's a big trough. Uh, but what do you get for the money? Well. Uh, according to the administration's own forecasts, it, if all the things that are supposed to be built get built, it will reduce U.S. carbon dioxide emissions by 5,000 million tons of CO2 per year. Sounds like a big number. So if I drew a graph, what I wanted, would want to show you is we're going to reduce our emissions by some number over the next decade for spending of 2 or $3 trillion. What's the rest of the world doing? In particular, China, since it's a global issue. Well, China's increased CO2 emissions, not over the decade, just over the next few years, are greater than what we're going to re re reduce our emissions by over the next decade. And that's just China. That's not counting South America. It's not counting Pakistan or India or Africa, none of which are buying into this trope. In fact, right now, China is building and completing about one coal plant a week. And they're doing this because coal is cheap and they're producing cheap electricity. And China is doing something else very clever in the sort of political pantheon of, <laughs> of the realignment of the world's economies. Uh, they're selling us the stuff that we're mandating. It's not a bad deal. So 80% of all the world's polysilicon, this is the silicon that makes solar panels, uh, is manufactured in China. Now why are they manufacturing it? Well. A physics factoid for you, the energy cost to make a pound of silicon is 100 times higher than the energy cost to make a pound of steel. So if you have something, and we're making this stuff by the kiloton now to put solar panels around the world. So you would, make, you would, you would want to manufacture something that energy intensive where electricity is cheap. Electricity is cheap in China. It's cheap in China because they're using coal. And the G has said they're going to keep finishing building the coal plants at least through 2030. And then they're saying we'll look at going to net zero ourselves. That's after they've spent a decade selling us the solar panels that we need and the lithium, lithium chemicals and the entire class of metals and minerals that are needed to build all the green machines. This is the Achilles heel of the green vision. It's not just the money in the geopolitical realignment, which is non-trivial. So China produces between 40% and 80%, depending on the specific mineral, copper, aluminum, manganese, lithium, cobalt. These are the suite of minerals you need to build wind turbines, solar panels, and electric car batteries. They are the refiner of record for 40 to 80% of those minerals. Those are called energy minerals. This is a market share globally 
double OPEC's market share in oil. They have not exercised pricing power yet. And I use the word yet for obvious reasons. I have no evidence that they're going to do any pricing power exercises uh, except the obvious. There's never been a m commodity market in the history of the world where one party <laughs> controls more than half of the world's supply. That they don't find themselves the need at some point in the geopolitical unfoldings of the world to exercise a little discipline on the rest of the market, which is what the Saudis did uh, in 1973 and 74. So could the Chinese do that? Yeah, sure. They could. Uh, it, it, would this be silly? It would be profoundly naive to think they're not going to do that. Could we, could we mine the copper instead? Do we need, does the copper matter? And can we mine it? So let me, you know, you hear a lot about can we get enough lithium because they're lithium batteries. This is a complete distraction and utterly irrelevant. Lithium is the least of the problems. The world has lots of lithium. Lithium's relatively easy to find. It's actually relatively easy to refine, although we we do very little of it. The only person that's going to be refining lithium in the United States is, you will be unsurprised to learn, if you haven't seen it in the news, is Elon Musk, who broke ground in Corpus Christi in July for a lithium refinery. Although it's not a full refinery, it's uh, an upgrade refinery. Like all things, there's the multi-step process. You, you, the lithium in the ground is worthless. You have to do a first stage of refining to get it to form, like a lithium carbonate that's useful. Then you have to upgrade it into the specific chemical form you need for the battery. He's doing the last stage. Not the mining, not the, not the pre first step refining. It's kind of like, you know, if you follow the gas business, you fractionate, you know, wet gas comes out of the ground, it has liquids in it, it has dry gas in it, you have to separate it. But then you have to do something later if you want to make chemicals out of it. So there's two stages. So copper, let's talk about copper, not lithium, because nothing in the electric world exists without copper. Copper is the long pole in the tent when it comes to the electrification of the world. Every electric vehicle uses something on the order of three to 400 pounds more copper than a conventional vehicle. Wind turbines take copper in the motors. Electric motors, electric generators are all copper. Distribution lines and distribution transformers on grids are all copper. Copper is not substitutable as an electrical metal except in high voltage, long distance transmission where we, we can use aluminum. But everywhere else, copper is not replaceable. You need copper. You can measure the copper demand that's needed by pounds per megawatt and pounds per megawatt mile of transmission. These are extremely well-known numbers. This industry is a century old. There's no magic in this. The physics of the periodic table are not going to change in the universe we live in, I'm sorry to say. Copper is a magical metal. Copper is the oldest mined metal in human history. Copper mines predate written history. We know lots about copper. And we know we're going to have to have somewhere between 200 and 300% more copper to build electric cars alone, never mind the distribution lines to get the electricity to the cars, in the next decade. Just the numbers. If you build as many cars as people claim, you'll need the copper. We also know that the world is not mining that much copper right now, nor are any of the world's copper miners planning to double, double their capacity, nor have they announced or committed to spending of that scale. This is true, by the way, for nickel, and it's true for cobalt, it's true for graphite, which is needed for batteries, it's true for all the metals. So the entire suite of metals that are needed for the green transition require between a 400% and a 7,000% increase in supply. The International Energy Agency says we need hundreds of new mines immediately. No one is building hundreds of new mines. When they say hundreds of mines, they don't mean picks and shovels in a little plot in somebody's boutique backyard. You can Google these up on the magic you know, Google machine. These are pits a mile across and a mile deep that have to be dug somewhere on the planet, other than here, typically. And then we need the refineries. <clears throat> None of this is happening. What is happening is on the margin, small steps towards it, by small on a relative basis. 10 million here, 20 million there. What the world's mining industries are doing right now, seeing this insanity go on, is consolidating. So if you imagine you're CEO of a mining company and you think that the world demand for copper is going to go up 200 to 400%. Goes up 50%, doesn't matter. That's a lot, of a lot of price pressure on copper. Your worry would be that if you spent billions of dollars starting to open a new mine, that four or five years into it, two billion in, the world changes its mind when the price of copper triples. And every appliance and every home gets more expensive because copper ripples through the entire economy. And the whole world says, you know, we changed our mind. 
Well, you're not going to do that after all. And you're stuck hanging out over the precipice with billions invested in a non-operating asset because you're not finished. And the price of copper collapses. So what would you do instead? Well, buy another copper mine. You buy an existing one. You, you, go, you, you do mergers and acquisitions. You, you prey on a weaker player to own their assets so that when you're using today's capital you, and you're guessing the price of copper is going to be whacked, you now get to enjoy the benefit of the higher, higher prices, of course, because that would be a brilliant business decision. That's going on if you follow the mining industry, because solidations are already beginning. It's also happening in the oil industry for exactly the same reason. That's hence the Exxon acquisition of, of Pioneer. So let, let me uh, do a few other uh, dispiriting factoids for those of you who might think we're entering in a great transition. I'll finish on electric vehicles because uh, the United Auto Workers is engaged in a, an epic strike. And I, by that I mean not, not epic politically. All strikes are fundamentally about the money. We're back to follow the money. And uh, this is about the money. It really is. And, you, and, and I have a certain amount of sympathy. I, you can't blame them. Um, and the reason you can't blame them is they're looking at the U.S. auto industry and the United States government of the 2 to $3 trillion in Inflation Reduction Act spending. More than half of it is directed at the auto industry. So we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars, a trillion dollars flooding into the auto sector and they're not getting a piece of it. You'd be annoyed. Uh, you, want, you want to find a way to get a piece of this because that's what unions do for their members. It just, I, I'm not saying this facetiously. It's ex that's the whole point of the union in this case. So what, what, are they, what, are they, what are they doing? Well, they're striking all three automakers simultaneously. In the nearly 90-year history of the United Auto Workers, they've never struck in the entire, almost a century, all three automakers simultaneously. So it's a serious action. And already we've seen a capitulation on the part of General Motors indicating that they will include the joint venture battery factories, and I use the word factory with air quotes, which are joint ventures and therefore outside of the union because they're not owned by GM and not owned by Ford. They're joint ventures with Asian battery makers, Japanese and Chinese and South Korean. Those joint ventures, they're saying they'll probably bring under union bargaining for a very simple reason. It's where the jobs are shifting. So the epic transition that we're being told is going to happen is because the EVs will do three things, and you've heard this repeated over and over again. But, and I have to stipulate, I admire Elon Musk. You can't explain Tesla away by tub subsidies. There weren't enough subsidies to make him successful. Just, you can't, it's, not, it's, a, it's an extremely well-engineered car. It's the best engineered battery still, I think, in the world. It's way ahead of everybody else on the engineering. Brilliant move. He's moved into the supply chains of everybody else. He's locked up lithium supplies, nickel supplies, copper supplies five years ago. While everybody else is now sucking wind trying to figure out where they're going to get it, he's got it. If, if when this whole thing, House of Cards, comes crashing down, probably Tesla is still standing. That it might be my bet. I'm not a stockholder in Tesla. Maybe I will be, <laughs> given where the world's going, because the market's going to get cleared of competition by the sheer destructive power of subsidies. But you've been told that the EVs are simpler vehicles, and therefore they'll eventually be cheaper, if not already. And simpler vehicles means less labor to make them. And so that's why the, you're being told United Auto Workers are striking. And they're going to be more convenient vehicles. You know, once we get all the public chargers in place and, you know, we'll, the, we'll solve the range anxiety because it's just simpler. Just plug it in. It's simple. It sounds simple. It's a motor, a battery, goo, boom. And it's, all that's not true. This is, it's just in the engineering physics of the real world we live in, none of it's true. They're not simpler. They're differently complicated. Let me explain what I mean. An internal combustion engine, you've been told, has lots of moving parts. It's complicated in the, in the transmission. And the gas tank, you know, is very simple. It's a steel tank with one pump. An electric vehicle has a simple propulsion system, a motor with one or two moving parts. And then it has a fuel system, the battery, which weighs a half ton, has thousands of parts, thousands of welds, a cooling system, a power control system, a safety system, and a physical and mechanical structural system. Sounds a lot like an internal combustion engine. In fact, from a viewpoint of complexity, the battery is, in fact, more complex than the internal combustion engine. And in fact, I'll take you one step further, you can make internal combustion engines with two moving parts. You cannot make a battery, a half-ton battery, with thousands of cells with two parts, ever. 
That's just the way, there, there's not a tank of goo. It's a complex electrochemical machine. So once I told you it's complicated, would, would you believe that it is easier to make it? No, it's just the labor just is shifted. In fact, if you, you can look this up, this is uncomplicated. Tesla is the only automaker that makes both electric motors, the propulsion system, and the fuel system, the battery. They're the only automaker that's doing that. And, good, and, and there's a good reason for that. He doesn't want to pay the margins to the electric motor maker. So he, he invented a, a superior electric motor. Uh, not profoundly better, but enough better. But he doesn't pay anybody any margin. It's his. And he makes the battery. He doesn't make the chemicals but he make, assembles the battery. So just like a GM plant that makes a transmission and an engine, they don't make the steel, like the input materials, but they make the transmission and the engines. Directly analogous to the Tesla motor and battery. You can go online and look up the data on this. The Tesla factory uses twice as much labor per vehicle, per drivetrain, as a standard internal combustion engine and transmission factory. Twice the labor, not less labor. It's not simpler. Now, it'll eventually match it. I think it, over the passage of time, engineers will get, get better at these things, and they might actually match the labor, <laughs> the labor efficiency of the 100-year-old internal combustion engine industry. So it's not simpler. The last thing that you're being told is, well, it's just more convenient. Just plug it in. And I guess this is the, if ever there were an example where people in the electric utility industry encounter the disconnect between people who think you just plug it in and what's involved behind the wall. I mean, you all know behind the wall is a very significant, non-trivial electric distribution and power system. But what you'd really want to know is not how you make the electricity. That matters. When you fuel an electric car, matters in terms of its impi environmental impact, self-evidently. By, by where, I don't mean and when. It matters to the minute in zip code. Because in the physics of the real world, when you put gasoline in your tank, it doesn't matter when you put the gasoline in. It doesn't matter where you put the gasoline in. It doesn't, mean, doesn't matter where you drive the car, when you drive the car. The energy it uses and the carbon dioxide emissions are the same, give or take a percent. I mean, high, for anybody here who's an engineer knows high altitude is less efficient. It burns a little more. Yeah, irrelevant. It's essentially the same. If you plug an electric car in at a time of day or location, it's very specific. It could be entirely coal-fired filling of a tank up. It could be entirely wind powered. It could be all gas powered. It could be a mix. But you have no idea because it just depends on where you are in a, on a grid in the world and the time of day you do it. Which is why the environmental movement that's enthusiastic about electric cars talks about smart charging. Now inside of that word there's buried a whole lot of sad stuff in my view. What does smart charging mean? Well I might want to provide you with an inducement, which is called penalty, to ensure that you don't charge your car at a time that's not convenient to the government to know when you should be putting fuel in that car. Like, happen to be having to use a coal plant right now because it's cloudy and not sunny and it's cold and the coal plants in your grid are running flat out. And that will mean that your fill up in carbon dioxide terms would probably match or exceed if you just drove a diesel truck. So we'll put a penalty on the kilowatt hour at that moment of time. Uh, a significant penalty. You know, you'll pay your fair share of the carbon dioxide emissions, but I can do that now because it's a smart meter. And they, they know that controlling when and where and how you charge is going to be critical to meet these chimerical goals for CO2 emissions reduction. Either, either that or they just make it the charger doesn't work. This is technically trivial. GPS locator on your car, GPS on the charger, and if you happen to plug it in when you're not supposed to charge it, you've misbehaved in CO2 terms, it won't work. You just wait. And when the wind starts blowing again, fill up. You're fine. Now, I'm being facetious, but I'm being serious. This is in the technical literature of the energy transition community. That, that's how they want the cars to work. Now, that's that's the inconvenient part. They want to control your behavior because it's in service of the carbon dioxide goal, of course. But they're serious about controlling your behavior. And if you don't like that, you know that, and again, this is being written, you should, you should ride a bicycle to work. You should walk. You should move to where you can walk. You should ride a scooter. And they're seriously talking about the need to ride more scooters. I, you know, I'm not going to say this to be mean about anybody in this room, but I don't see anybody here that's going to be riding scooters to work. I just, uh, bicycles, uh, I love bicycles and scooters. They're obviously a silly uh, plan in terms of the mass transportation of people. That's why cars are so convenient. 
But I'll end on one last the money piece that's being ignored. So in the EV world, the claim is that people aren't buying EVs because of range anxiety. This is a complete uh, misdirection. It's not true. Anybody that's ever looked at an EV or thought about buying one knows you can find an EV. Most of them have the same range as your gasoline car. 90% of EVs on the market have a 300 mile plus range, the 400 mile range. You can get some with 500 mile range, 250, lots of cars only have 300 mile range. Very common. So what's the problem? The problem is obvious. How long it takes to fuel your car. The, the thing that matters to human beings is the most precious commodity in the universe is our time. Our time is precious because it's not, it's not in infinite supply as we all discover as we consume some of the years of living. So when you, when you we refuel your regular car, and you may not have done this, I did this as an experiment. I had in my head how long it took me to refuel. I was trying to guess. Because that oh, pays attention to that. Because it's you, know, you pull up to a gas pump, fill up, or have somebody fill up for you, depending on where you live. It's about three minutes for a typical car. From pulling up, stopping, swiping, filling, and leaving. Could be four. Well, electric cars with three or four hundred mile range, if you plug them in at the low voltage charger, it's overnight, so no one's planning to do that for trips. They want to get to a supercharger on the road. Superchargers can refuel about 80% of your fuel, depending on the supercharger, in 30 to 40 minutes. Okay, it's a lot better than eight hours. 30 to 40 minutes is, is 10 times longer than the four minutes of typical. Now this, this has a cascade effect on both convenience and cost, and I'm gonna end with a, an illustration of where the money is being hidden on this. So the Biden administration has $7 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act to install superchargers around the country. Sounds like a big number. Is that what we need? Well, here's the thing you need to know. The supercharger that does the 30 to 40 minutes instead of four minutes, one supercharger costs about $200,000. A gasoline pump, if you have any friends who are in the business of owning gasoline pump franchises, is $20,000. So you buy the pump that pumps the gasoline in a regular car, it's a $20,000 capital expense. Forget the gasoline, it's a CapEx. The supercharger that does 40 minutes instead of four minutes is 200,000, some of them are 400,000, but I'm using the low end. So it's 10 times more expensive. If I own a filling station that looks like, you know, a 7-Eleven or Sheets that has eight or 10 pumps, and th those pumps are cycling at a four to five minute rate, and I want to service that many people on a, on a highway, how many pumps I'm going to need if each one takes 40 minutes? 10 times more. So I'm going to be paying 10 times more per pump, and I need 10 times the number of pumps, and a lot more land wherever that fuel station happens to be. And it gets worse than that. So that somebody's going to spend that money. That money will be deployed by somebody and paid for by somebody. And when paid for in kilowatt hour terms, it raises the cost of a fill up well beyond the cost of gasoline, by the way. We already know this because that's happening in Europe. But the infrastructure upstream is where the real big hit comes. A, a filling station on a highway, when you drive by, it looks like kind of like a 7-Eleven because it essentially is with pumps that have tr tiny motors. And it uses the, has the electric demand of a 7-Eleven, of, of a convenience store, which is a couple hundred kilowatts. If I put 20 or 30 superchargers there, the electric demand of that filling station rises to a steel mill. A steel mill. So drive around Mississippi, uh, I mean I've been in, driven in every state of the union, and look at f filling stations, how many you need for convenience, and think that every one of those is going to have the electric demand of a small town or a steel mill, every single one. And uh, tell me how you're going to pay for the electric infrastructure to get 10 to 20 to 50 megawatts to thousands and thousands of filling stations. These are, these are the, this is a knowable number too, by the way. If you're in the state of Mississippi, you could ask the engineers who work at the utility, pretend that we actually have superchargers at every one of these filling stations. What do I need? Not for electric energy, not for the energy, you need energy. Infrastructure, the CapEx to get the distribution system to handle steel mills every 30 to 40 miles. And the number nationally is somewhere between a half trillion and a trillion dollars. So we'll have to add not to get more energy out, just to deliver the physical infrastructure, close to a trillion dollars of copper-infused transformers and distribution lines. This is, this is uh, I'll say it again, this is not gonna happen. We're gonna spend a lot of money on, on starting down that path. There'll be lots more electric cars for wealthy families. 
uh, 80% of all EVs in America are sold to two and three car households because it's a second or third car, it's just fine. And charging it overnight in your garage is very convenient. And that's a lot of cars, millions of cars, tens of millions of cars. It's not a transition. It won't, it won't happen and it won't end well trying. What will happen is we're going to make a lot of citizens extremely unhappy when they discover the policymakers have pushed them into a, a regime of higher costs, less convenience, and frankly, um, geopolitical dependencies. So it will be, it will be unpretty uh, in the next few years, and I think it'll start unfolding in the next few years. I'll end with this. I, I have a podcast called The Last Optimist. I don't sound very optimistic <laughs> saying these things. Uh, I am extremely optimistic that we'll get through this, uh, it, <laughs> and the insanity will become obvious, and the really good news is America is so wealthy uh, it, this is immorally destructive to the lower income families, middle class families. But as a country, we're so wealthy, we, can, we actually can afford the insanity. We'll spend a trillion dollars unproductively. It's a $25 trillion a year economy, so over the coming years, we'll, we'll recover from it and grow. And this will, it'll be great. And most of the growth, you all probably can guess where I'm going to say it's going to occur, probably going to be south, uh, which, is, which is good. It's already happening. Thank you. <laughs>